Welcome! In this video, we'll be covering the basic definitions of set theory, but without going into the axiomatic foundations. However, towards the end of the video, we'll see some problems that arise with this naive approach, and that will motivate doing things axiomatically, which we'll cover in the next video. We'll start out by informally defining what a set is. So a set is a collection of things that we regard as a single object. So if you want, you can think of a set as a sort of bag or container that has a bunch of stuff in it. And well, the set is this bag or container itself. Now, if A is a set, then we adopt the following notation. So we write X is an element of A like this using this element symbol here, if uh, the object X is contained in the collection A. On the other hand, if X does not belong to the collection A, then we write the element symbol with a strike through to express that X is not an element of the set A. Finally, we say what it means for two sets to be the same. So two sets A and B are considered to be equal if they have precisely the same elements. In uh, logical formulas, we can write this like so. So for all elements X, X is an element of A precisely when X is an element of B. In other words, sets are purely determined by the elements they contain. So if two sets have the same elements, they are in fact the same set. Let's see some examples. So the first example here on the left defines a set A, and it's a set that contains three elements in this case. So the element two, the element three, and the element five. And uh, when we write sets, we usually enclose the elements in these curly uh, brackets to indicate that they define a set. On the other hand, we have this set B here, which consists of all the solutions to the following polynomial equation. So x to the third minus 10x squared plus 31x minus 30 is equal to zero. So this is sort of a less explicit definition of a set, but it's a set nonetheless because it describes certain elements, namely the solutions to this equation. In fact, it turns out that the sets A and B are in fact the same because the solutions that this equation here has are precisely the numbers two, three, and five. This means that despite the fact that these sets are described in very different manners, they are in fact the same set because they have exactly the same elements in them. An important consequence of the definition of equality of sets is that neither order nor multiplicity of elements in sets matters. For instance, the set containing x and y in this order is the same set as the set containing y and x written in this order. The reason these two sets are the same is because they contain exactly the same elements. So if you look at any element in this left set, you'll find that it's also an element of the right set. And conversely, any element of the right set is also an element of the left set. And that's precisely the definition for sets to be equal. The second point here is perhaps a bit more difficult to see if you've never encountered it before, namely that multiples in sets don't matter. For example, the set containing the element x listed twice is the same as the set containing the element x just listed once. Again, the reason these sets are the same is because they contain the same elements. However, from that phrase containing the same elements, it's maybe not clear that you would disregard multiplicities. However, if you recall the, the formula for saying that two sets are equal, it said that for all x, so x is an element of A, uh, if and only if x is an element of B. So if you look at any element x that occurs in the first set here, so either this one or this one, well, both of them are x and they also occur in B. So this direction of the implication holds. And conversely, if we take any element in B, well, there's only one of them, namely x, we find that it's also uh, an element of A. And therefore, we have that, well, for all possible uh, elements x here, x lies in A precisely when x lies in B, and therefore these two sets are equal. This means that you can sort of extend your mental picture if you're thinking of the set as a bag, well then, sort of uh, inherently, the, the elements in the bag are somehow not ordered. And also, you have to think of this bag as somehow not caring about how many of the elements you have in the bag. We now move on to define the perhaps most important set of all, 
despite the fact that it has no elements. So the empty set is the set that has no elements, and it's denoted by this symbol here. Another way that you can write the empty set is also just as uh, brackets with, with no elements inside, but uh, this symbol is usually used. The reason the empty set is so important is because, well, it's very simple, and you can build more complicated sets based just on the empty set. For example, you can consider the set that contains the empty set, and in this case, the empty set is an element of, well, the set containing the empty set. So this thing you should think about as sort of an empty bag being inside another bag. And in that case, the empty bag is contained in the, well, larger bag which contains the empty bag. So while the empty set is an element of this set containing the empty set, it's not the case that the empty set is equal to the set containing the empty set. On the one hand, you have an empty bag here on the left, and on the other side, you have a bag containing the empty bag, and these are not the same. You can also uh, check this more rigorously using the definition of equality. So in this case, we have a set which contains a single element, namely the empty set, whereas the empty set itself has no elements, and therefore these two sets don't have the same elements. For similar reasons, it's also the case that the empty set is not an element of the empty set because, well, the empty set doesn't have any elements. So these are just some examples of uh, using this element symbol and equality of sets on these uh, sets we construct from the empty set. Moving on, we're going to define the notion of being a subset. So a set A is a subset of B, and we write it as follows. So we write uh, A subset B with this uh, subset symbol here. Um, if every element of A is also an element of B, or written in uh, logical formulas, for all x, if x is an element of A, then that implies that x is an element of B. For example, for any set A, the empty set is a subset of that set A. The reason for this is that, well, the empty set contains no elements, and therefore, trivially, any element of the empty set is also an element of A. Perhaps I should also give a less trivial example here. So consider the set C containing the elements 1 and 2. Well, then this is a subset of the set containing the elements 1, 2, and 3. Uh, let's call this one here uh, D, because every element in this set also occurs in this set. On the other hand, this set here isn't a subset of this set because we have this element 3 occurring here, which doesn't occur in this set. Finally, we need to be careful to distinguish the notion of being a subset from the notion of being an element of a set. For instance, here, uh, the set containing the empty set is an element of the set containing the set containing the empty set. So if you look at this thing here, you see that it's an element of this uh, larger set. But it's not the case that this set here is a subset of this larger set. Why is that? Well, in order for this set here to be a subset of this set, it would have to be the case that every element of this set is also an element of this set. But you see that the only element of this set is the empty set. And this set here doesn't contain uh, the empty set. It only contains the set containing the empty set, and that's different from the empty set, as we saw previously up here. We now move on to something called uh, set comprehension, or sometimes also called abstraction. This allows us to define new sets based on a given property. So for this, we let capital Phi of x be some sort of property, and then we denote by uh, this notation here, so the set of x for which phi of x holds, like so, we denote by this the collection of elements x which satisfy this property. To give you some examples of how this can be used, let's define the union, intersection, and difference of two sets. So for this, let a and b be sets, and then we first define their union, a union b, with this union symbol, to be the set of all x such that x is an element of A or x is an element of B. As in logic, this or here is meant to be inclusive, which means that the union A union B contains all the elements that lie either in A 
or in B, or in both sets. We next define the intersection of two sets, so A intersect B with this uh, intersection symbol here, to be the set of all elements x, such that x is an element of A, and also x is an element of B. In other words, the intersection contains those elements which A and B have in common. And finally, we can define the difference between A and B. So the difference A minus B here is the set of all x such that x lies in A, but x does not lie in B. In other words, the difference A minus B is all the elements of A, but we eliminate all of those elements that also occur in B. Now in all of these three definitions here, we followed this comprehension scheme where we've just uh, replaced phi of x here with the corresponding properties that I've written down here. All right, let's give some examples of these operations. So uh, consider the following two sets. So I have A being the set containing the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and B being the set containing the numbers 1, 4, and 9. Now let's uh, calculate their union, intersection, and difference. So for the union, I just need to take all elements which lie either in A or in B or both. So basically I'm just combining all of the elements that occur here. And because sets don't care about multiplicities, for instance this one here occurs in both sets, I just have to write it down once in the union. So the union of these two sets will be 1, 2, 3, and then I also have the elements from B, uh, which are 4 and 9. And again, if I wanted to, I could write this one twice, but uh, it doesn't have any uh, effect on the identity of the set. Okay, next let's uh, consider the intersection between these sets. So the intersection are all the elements that these sets have in common, and you can see that the only element that occurs in both sets is this one here. So the intersection between A and B is the set just containing 1. Finally, let's consider the difference between A and B. So these are all the elements in A that do not occur in B. For instance, 2 is an element of A which does not occur in B, and the same goes for 3. On the other hand, 1 occurs both in A and in B, and therefore it's not part of the difference. Hence, the result of the difference A minus B will just be the set containing uh, 2 and 3, because these are all the elements that lie in A, but do not lie in B. If we combine the comprehension principle together with the definition of subsets, we get something called the power set of a set. So the power set of a set A is just the set of all of its subsets. And we use this uh, curly P here, to denote the power set of A, and uh, using our comprehension notation it's just the set of X such that X is a subset of the set A. This is again best illustrated using an example. So uh, consider the following set A containing the elements 1 and 2. Now let's uh, calculate its power set. So the power set should be all possible subsets that A has. Okay, so the power set of A will consist of the following elements, so it'll be a big set containing a lot of stuff. So first we noted that uh, the empty set is always a subset of any set. Uh, therefore the empty set will always be an element of the power set of any set. Next we need to, well, find more subsets of this set here. So one more subset is just the set containing the element 1. Right, the reason this is a subset of A is because every element of this set, well, namely the only element 1, is also an element of A. And similarly, the uh, set containing just the element 2 is also a subset of A, because every element of this set here is also an element of A. And finally, we have uh, A itself, so the set containing 1 and 2, that's also a subset of A, because every element of A is an element of A, that's sort of trivial. Okay, so in this case the power set has four elements, and each of these elements is itself a set, namely a subset of this original set A. In fact, one can show that the power set always has 
uh, 2 to the cardinality of a elements. So the cardinality of a is just the number of elements that a has, and the power set will always be 2 raised to that power uh, in size. The reason for this is essentially that, well, when choosing subsets of some set, you can always either include an element or not. And so for each element in the set, you have a binary choice whether to include it or not, and so all combinations will uh, then give you 2 to the power of the number of elements in the original set. This already brings us to the final definitions for this video. So first, I am going to define something called an ordered pair, which is denoted like this. So it's a pair of elements x and y, and we put it in these uh, pointy brackets to differentiate it from the set containing x and y. And such an ordered pair, as the name suggests, should care about the order the elements occur in it, unlike sets. One way to express this is to say that such an ordered pair is characterized by the following property. So if you look at two ordered pairs like this, so the ordered pair containing x and y, and the ordered pair containing x prime and y prime, well, then these ordered pairs should be the same if and only if, well, the first element of each pair is actually the same, and also the second element of each pair is the same. If you compare this to sets, you'll see that the corresponding property does not hold for sets. So we saw this example previously where we had a set containing like x and y and the set containing y and x. And these two sets were in fact equal, despite the fact that the first component of this set here is not the same as the first component of the other set. We'll see in the next video that in fact we can construct such ordered pairs using sets but for the moment, I just like to leave this as sort of a primitive notion, which has this property here as its uh, defining characteristic. Using ordered pairs, we can now define the Cartesian product of two sets, A and B. And the Cartesian product is denoted by this uh, time symbol here. So we get a new set, A times B. And this is simply the set of ordered pairs, A comma B, where the first component lies in A, and the second component lies in B. Here again, it's probably easiest just to see an example. So consider again this set A, which has the elements 1 and 2, and the set B, which contains elements uh, X and Y. Now for these sets, let's calculate the Cartesian product. So the Cartesian product is the set of ordered pairs where the first component lies in A and the second component lies in B. So there are four such possible ordered pairs. So in the first case, I have uh, 1 as its first component and x as the second component. And then I have 1 as the first component and y as the second component. And then I can uh, take 2 as the first component and x as the second component. Or I could take 2 as the first component and y as the second component. And that's all possible uh, combinations there. Okay, so you see that the Cartesian product here is a set of ordered pairs. And in fact, the size of the Cartesian product is always the size of the first set multiplied by the size of the second set, which is one reason why this notation here with a time symbol makes sense. So far, we've seen a bunch of definitions of these basic set theoretic constructions and operations. And in fact, these operations are like related to one another in some interesting ways. So here I'm going to describe a couple of laws that hold for the set theoretic operations of unions, intersections, and uh, set difference. So the first property uh, that holds is that unions and intersections are commutative. So A union B is the same thing as B union A, and the same thing goes for intersections. So A intersected with B is the same set as B intersected with A. So one way of going about this is to show, well, that these two sets have exactly the same elements. And, well, a nice scheme to do this is to first show that every element of this set is an element of this set, and then to show that every element of this set is an element of this set. Perhaps a more direct way of going about showing these equalities is to use the fact that the defining properties for these sets are logically equivalent. So remember that A union B here is just the set of X such that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. And now this thing here uh, we called 
let's say, 5x. So this is the property that defines um, this set. And now if you substitute this property with any other logically equivalent property, then you'll get the same set. For instance, this set here is also the same as all x such that x is an element of b or x is an element of a. And the reason for this, maybe let's call this uh, psi of x here. So psi of x is the same as phi of x except that the order has been reversed. The reason that these two sets are the same is because these formulas here, phi of x and psi of x, are logically equivalent. As we saw in a previous video on propositional logic, this or connective disjunction is commutative. And in turn, this means that, well, some element x will satisfy this formula here, if and only if it satisfies the logically equivalent formula psi of x. Hence, well, the x that satisfy phi of x are exactly the same x that satisfy psi of x, and that means that these two sets here are the same. All right, but this latter set here is just the union of b with a by definition. In other words, the reason that uh, this commutativity for the union holds is because disjunction is commutative. And the same goes basically for intersections. So intersections are defined in terms of conjunctions, and the reason the intersection is commutative is because conjunction is commutative. In fact, this type of argument shows that any sort of identity that holds for logical connectives will also hold for the corresponding set theoretic operations. For instance, unions and intersections are associative. And the reason for this is, again, because conjunction and disjunction are associative. Maybe more interesting is the distributive property. So we saw in the video on propositional logic that conjunction distributes over disjunction, and also disjunction distributes over conjunction in the following manner. So um, A and B or C is the same as A and B or A and C. And hence, this type of equivalence transfers to set theoretic operations as well. So if you intersect a union with a set A, it's the same as intersecting the individual sets with A and then unioning the result. And the same goes if you interchange uh, the union and intersection. Next, unioning and intersecting with the empty set is particularly easy. So if you union any set with the empty set, you just get back the original set. The reason for this is that the empty set doesn't have any elements in it which you would add to the union. And similarly, if you intersect any set with the empty set, you just get the empty set. Well, because the empty set has no elements, the elements that are common to both the empty set and any other set are none because the empty set doesn't have any. And finally, there are versions of De Morgan's laws for sets as well. So here it says that if we take any set C and we subtract a union, A union B, what we get is the same as if we first subtracted A from C and then intersected the result with what we get if we subtract B from C. Now the way this relates to the De Morgan's laws for logic is that set uh, difference here is somehow like negation. So remember that the negation of a disjunction is a conjunction of the negated versions of the, the propositions. And uh, that's exactly what uh, this thing is expressing here. So if you think of this C minus as a negation, then you see that, well, in fact, you're like negating the individual sets and you're switching the union into an intersection. That's like in the De Morgan's law where we switch disjunction to a conjunction. And the same thing also holds if you uh, take a difference between C and an intersection, then you get a union of the individual uh, differences here. And again, if you wanted to prove this, you would just write out the definition of this left-hand set and notice that the property that defines this is precisely the sort of property which you can apply the De Morgan's law from logic on, and then you can transform it into the defining uh, property for this set on the right. This concludes our whirlwind tour of the basic definitions of set theory. So I'm aware that this was quite fast. If you want uh, more detail on this sort of stuff, I can again recommend the book, uh, How to Prove It um, by uh, Velemon. So it contains uh, all of these definitions and more, as well as uh, a lot more set theoretic identities that you can try to prove for yourself.
so far, the whole uh, set theory might seem quite simple. Basically, you just define sets in terms of uh, this comprehension principle. However, there are some uh, problems that can arise when you do this. Here, I'll show you uh, two ways that the comprehension principle can lead to paradoxes. Uh, the first one is quite fun. So consider the following set, namely all elements x such that x is a natural number that can be described in exactly 11 words. Now, according to our informal definition of this set comprehension principle, well, this thing here, this sentence, is certainly some sort of property. Um, so it's saying that x is a natural number that can be described in 11 words. So that should be some kind of property. Therefore, we should be able to form this set. However, this is uh, contradictory for the following reason. So uh, consider the following uh, number y, namely the smallest natural number that can't be described in 11 words. So the question is now, is y an element of, uh, of this set here? On the one hand, by the definition of y, it's the smallest natural number which cannot be described in 11 words. And so y should not belong to this set, right? Because this set only consists of those natural numbers which can be described in 11 words. OK, so we would uh, conclude that no, y is not an element of this set. On the other hand, if you count the number of words in this description of y, you see that it contains exactly 11 words. So we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 words describing this number y. And therefore, well, this number y can be described in exactly 11 words because its definition does exactly that. And so y should actually be an element of this set. So on the one hand, y cannot belong to this set by definition of y. And on the other hand, the definition of y exactly uh, satisfies the criteria to include it in this set. And so we're kind of left in a limbo here. So what's going on? It's somehow uh, a paradox. Uh, y should simultaneously be an element of the set, and also it shouldn't be an element of the set. So something's definitely going wrong here, and the thing that's maybe suspicious is this uh, condition we put, so this property here. So somehow this being described is, is somehow the issue. This property is somehow uh, allows you to create uh, elements which are like have this property in a self-referential manner. So this issue here could be solved by not allowing these types of properties to be properties that uh, define sets using comprehension. For example, if we restrict um, these types of properties to be just first order logic formulas, then this type of paradox here, at least in this form, can't arise. So that's uh, one motivation for being more formal about uh, the types of properties we allow in these types of set comprehensions. The second problem which I want to present, which is perhaps more serious, is called Russell's paradox. And it shows that even if we restrict these properties of the comprehension to first order logic formulas, we can get paradoxical results. So for this, we consider the following set A. So A consists of all elements x, such that x is not an element of itself. Again, you can see that there's some sort of self-referential thing going on, which will cause a paradox. So the question we're now going to ask, well, is A an element of itself? So is this set that we've defined in this manner an element of itself? So essentially, there are two cases, right? So either A is an element of itself or it isn't. So first, uh, let's suppose that A is indeed an element of itself. OK, but then it's not the case that A is not an element of itself. So it is not the case uh, that A is not an element of itself, right? Because if it's an element of itself, then it can't simultaneously not be an element of itself. But then we notice that in that case, A doesn't satisfy the property that you need in order to be an element of A. Well, hence, because A doesn't satisfy the defining property of A, uh, A is in fact not an element of A. But this contradicts our assumption that A is an element of itself. 
So th this is somehow contradictory, and hence uh, this can't be the case. On the other hand, if we assume that A is not an element of itself, well, then A indeed satisfies the defining property of A, right? Because uh, the set A consists of all sets that aren't elements of themselves. And so, in fact, if we assume that A is not an element of itself, then by the way we've defined A, A is in fact an element of itself. But that also contradicts our hypothesis. So in, in either case, we get a contradiction. And so this question of whether A is an element of itself, again, doesn't have an answer. And that causes the paradox. Now, because of all this self-referential business, uh, following this argument can be quite confusing. So uh, the best strategy here is just to go through it on your own uh, once again. Now, this Russell's paradox here is quite a bit more serious than the paradox from above, because in this case, the property that defines this comprehension is actually a perfectly valid first-order logic formula. Nonetheless, in this case, we actually don't have a definitive answer whether a certain element, in this case A, is an element of the set. And in principle, we would always want this statement to be either true or false. Otherwise, it's really not clear what the elements of such a set should be. And well, if you don't know exactly what the elements of a given set are, then you can't really uh, compare it with any other set, and then everything kind of breaks down. So the solution to this paradox is basically to say that this thing is, in fact, not a set. And to uh, make sure that uh, we never actually create this type of uh, situation when we construct new sets from old ones. We'll see in the next video that uh, one way to avoid uh, the situation is to introduce a more restricted form of comprehension where you don't consider like all possible elements x that satisfy a certain property, but rather you're only allowed to consider certain element x that already live in an existing set that satisfy a certain property. In other words, the comprehensions we'll be writing will be something of the form like this. So we have something like we consider all the elements x in a pre-existing set such that uh, phi of x holds. Now the problem with this type of thing here is that, for instance, unions no longer can be written as a comprehension because you would somehow have to have a larger set which contains all the elements that both A and B contain. And well, if you only have A and B, and you only know that those two are sets, you don't necessarily know that their union will also be a set. And therefore, if you want to restrict comprehension in this manner, you have to introduce additional axioms that tell you, for instance, that the union of two sets is again a set. So in summary, to avoid this type of uh, paradox here, we need to somehow be more careful about how we uh, build sets. And this in turn means that also we need to have more axioms which describe exactly what types of operations we're allowed to perform. So I hope this uh, motivates the need to uh, consider some sort of axiomatic set theory that uh, makes sure that we don't run into these types of problems. And that's exactly what we'll be covering in the next video.